Welcome back to Austin P. State University. Today we're going to begin in chapter 11 on page 238 with the different kinds of theater, the many types of theater. And uh, the official word for that is genre. Genre. Uh, it just means kind, this type of theater. And it's worth saying that many playwrights don't sit down and think, today I'm going to write a romantic comedy or a sci-fi fantasy. Uh, they sit down and they write something and then critics like you and I go back and kind of assign a genre. Uh, genres are sort of speculative. Uh, if you are on Netflix or if you've ever experimented with Pandora, uh, you know that the, the songs they suggest for you based on the kind of music they think you like in a specific genre can be kind of a limiting question when people ask you uh, what kind of music do they like and they're expecting you to say, oh, I like country music or I like rap music or even worse, I don't like any country music or any rap music. Uh, you know, it's not always easy to sort of pigeonhole an art form based on these sort of genres that critics go back and apply to to art. Uh, but it's useful in discussing um, and understanding art in general, so we will use them. Um, in Athens, in ancient Greece, the golden age of Greece, there was only two. Rom it was either a comedy or a tragedy, one or the other. And they had very strict guidelines on what a uh, comedy should be and a tragedy should be. They were very formulaic. Uh, as you know, they wrote three plays back to back. Usually uh, they would perform them from sunup to sundown with a quick little comedy in the meantime uh, to sort of uh, lighten the mood, but three tragedies right there in a row. And uh, so... Um, so today we'll be looking at about five Western and four Eastern genres. Western much more in depth and the Eastern will just kind of touch on those so that you know they exist. Um, I am much more familiar with the Western tradition. So. Um, so an important question for you as theater appreciators, as theater critics, is to ask yourself, what was this play trying to accomplish? We talked about this a little bit uh, earlier. What does, the tray want, what does the play want you to feel? If you walk into a scary movie and you're not scared, then they haven't accomplished what they want you to do. Um, was it successful in its own right? In and of itself, did it do what it wanted to do? Not based on what you like. So if you ask me to come see a scary movie, first of all, I'm going to say no. I'm not going to waste my money because I don't like most scary movies. Um, but then even if I do watch something, and I, you know, well, I like Sweeney Todd, Hitchcock, those things. I will ask myself, are those successful in and of their own right, what they were trying to accomplish? Even if it's not my favorite kind of uh, genre, is it was successful at wanted it, what it wanted you to feel? Um, did it succeed in what it was trying to do, right? So um, when people stand back and say, oh, you know, I can't believe there's all this criticism uh, I can't believe that a vampire is, glows like diamonds in the sunlight. Well, the whole common like idea of vampires is fantasy. It's all implausible. So to sort of critique um, the implausibility of a pretty vampire, well, you know, uh, we're talking about a monster that sucks people's blood. So are, is that really where you want to put your criticism on Rotten Tomatoes for the world to see? Um, you know, if you go to see a musical, you just need to know that in the genre itself, it's going to be a little bit cheesy, right? People are breaking in out into song and dancing. If you don't like whim musicals, if you don't like cheesiness, I probably wouldn't suggest that you go and see a musical or critique it according to your own tastes, right? Um, most children's stories are going to appeal to children. Now I have Shrek here as a good example because they have a tendency to appeal to adults as well. But if you go to Nashville Children's Theater and you look around and the parents look bored, that's not really Nashville Children's Theater problem. 
as long as those kids are standing up and yelling and hooting and hollering and excited about the princess dresses, you know, their dads can be as bored as they want. But as long as those little girls are excited by princess dresses, they are succeeding in what they're trying to accomplish. And so a good idea for us as theater appreciators is to first to understand what was the genre, what was the style of the writing material. And for many of these, it will be embedded in a certain time period of what is popular, right? So if you go to see a 1940s American musical with tap dancing and jazz hands and um, sequins, then it is part of a movement that became popular in a certain time, in a certain place. So a good theater artist sees what was going on there and sort of capitalizes on it and, and kind of goes with the flow of that genre. Let me give you an example. I had a dear um, professor uh, who made a questionable decision. It was a bold choice. But uh, the play Little Shop of Horrors is kind of a campy musical. It's very much a part of that 1950s uh you know, sci-fi uh, kitsch, and she tried to set it in the 90s and tried to play it kind of more as, as more of like a serious drama rather than a humorous, kitschy story. And it, it didn't get good reviews, and I don't blame the people who reviewed it. I saw it as well, because you're fighting against the genre of the play, what it is. Now, there are other times when that's completely appropriate. Uh, you look at Shakespeare, you know, people play um, play against type sometime, and it's interesting. But some plays are very dated. They come from a certain genre. They come from a certain time. And fighting against what the author was doing can be counterproductive. So know the genre, understand the genre. If you choose to go against the genre, that's a strong choice. Um, but uh, in, in many cases, fully researching the genre itself can help you to better understand the play. All right, so uh, the, let me read this quote from Aristotle. We're going back to the history of the genres. It consists in some ugly defect or ugliness, which is not painful or destructive. To take for an obvious example, the comic mask, which is ugly and distorted, but it does not imply pain. So what Aristotle is saying about the ancient Grecian comedy is that it needs to be lighthearted. It needs to be chuckling and funny. He would probably enjoy Seinfeld and some of these lighthearted comedies. Now, of course, Aristotle's idea of a lighthearted comedy would be greatly challenged when it came to Chekhov and Brecht and, um, you know, some of the more darker comedies that we have, anything Danny DeVito's ever been in. Uh, you know, but the idea initially, the sort of formula that Aristotle s set up that many people still adhere to is a sense of lightheartedness when it comes to comedy, only the trivial things, right? The tragedies, though, right, uh, were insanely cathartic and painful and harsh event after harsh event after harsh event. I mean, we talked about Oedipus. You got an idea of the kind of um, very uh, just sadness going through the story. So um, in comedy, generally, as it was speculated in ancient Greece, should celebrate love and birth. Think about how many comedies you've seen with weddings in them. That's no coincidence because Aristotle set out from the beginning that um, the essence of a comedy is a celebration of love. Whereas tragedy is much more death-centric. Kind of at the, at the essence of a good tragedy is any human struggle against the idea of their own mortality. Comedies end in a wedding. Luke, like half of Shakespeare's plays, he stuck pretty closely to the Aristotelian model. He almost always ended in a wedding if it was a comedy. Um, tragedies often ended with a, a stage littered with bodies, lots and lots of death. Or, in the case of Oedipus, exile, which is a sentence worse than death, right? To be alienated, to be alone, to... Um, be set out to wander the earth sad and alone. 
Um, comedy usually happened in a social group, in a town, in friends, right? Five friends, best friends, all together. That's a common formula for comedy. Whereas in tragedy, even though it may happen in a town, many of the person's soliloquies, many of the person's um, struggles, they feel alone. So when we look at um, some great tragedies, they feel like the mob mentality is against them. And so even though, of course, it's not just always one person alone on stage, they still feel alone. Now here is perhaps the most offensive side of things, which is that comedy usually is someone we're laughing at. Someone who is in some way stupid or pitiable or weak. Falstaff, the great Shakespearean character, was fat. So, so jovial and fat. And everyone made fat jokes at his expense. And it was hilarious how fat and poor he was. Um, these are the characters that tend to get a laugh are the ones who are in some way easy to mock. Either they're stupid or poor or in some way pitiable. Now, in tragedy, um, Aristotle really encouraged people to write stories about people worth talking about. Um, now, we would turn this on our heads when we get to realism, but it had to be someone who was um, either in the royal succession or the town mayor or the king. Uh, you notice Hamlet and Hamlet, Macbeth and Macbeth. These people are the... Um, leaders and, and the rich people that we focus on, um, uh, the people who are making the decisions that change the world. Those are the people that we're going to write about. Those are the stories we're going to tell is important people. Comedy, once again, relatively painless, relatively lighthearted, whereas in tragedy, Everything is painful. Everything is something we can all mourn together. Call that catharsis. In comedy, we have ludicrous extremes, right? Ridiculous things happening that are not even physically possible, which is part of the reason why Midsummer plays so well. I'm sorry, Midsummer Night's Dream plays so well as a comedy because people are being turned into donkeys and fairies are flying through the sky, right? Just these ridiculous extremes. Whereas tragedy, there are clear consequences for every action and reaction. So that's why a true Grecian tragedy is so rare nowadays, um, because many of our stories uh, are not quite so black and white, good and bad, um, it's not quite so reckoning or guilt oriented. Whereas in the Grecian frame of mind, um, you know, the end of the story was usually a settling of score. It was usually righteousness coming back around to bite somebody in the ass. I mean, it was really usually somebody was going to get it in the end. So that's kind of our look at comedy and tragedy. Farce! Yay, farce! So we have moved along and we are on page 240. Um, a uh, farce is a very specific kind of comedy and I said about you know ridiculous extremes a donkey being turned in a person being turned into a donkey a uh, farce is way over the top silliness and as you can see the primary thing that I put here about farce is physical comedy right um, perhaps the most popular stage play is um, Noises Off, which is a British comedy with lots of doors slamming. I would argue that Frasier is a sitcom that's a farce. Uh, lots of over-the-top sort of silliness going on. Farce is one of my personal favorites. But even though it is a lot of ridiculousness and silliness, at its heart, it really has revolution in mind. Um, usually when someone is poking fun at the system, it is with the idea that they can overthrow the system or change the system from the inside, right? Um, not always. Sometimes farces are just silly and fun and end at that. But if you look at um, many of particularly the comedy of manners where um, playwrights are making fun of the hypocrisies of the aristocrats, you know, the way of the world, um, country wife, they're doing that in order to point 
to the aristocrats in the face and say, look at how silly you're being, look in the mirror, we need to change this system. If you look at a, a show like Stephen Colbert, um, where he's being ridiculous, he's often doing it with a biting edge that makes you rethink your current paradigm, your current um, ideas about the world. So um, the goal of farce is usually revolution, to change the current system, poke fun and motivate. SNL is a great example of another farce. Saturday Night Live, sorry. Okay, some other kinds of comedies. Uh, of course, you're probably familiar with a romantic comedy. This is one that's still pretty popular today. Um, you know, they've become very cookie cutter nowadays. Uh, although I love You've Got Mail. It's one of my favorites still. <laughs> uh, a comedy of manners is to, like I was just talking about, poking fun at the aristocrats. The comedy of ideas are much less popular, um, but they are kind of the same idea in that um, kind of more philosophical uh, Nietzsche kind of making fun of um, society's blemishes and so it's it's along the same idea as farce but a little more high comedy so when I say high comedy I mean that it's more in the wit in the repartee in the way that the people talk to each other whereas low comedy is more physical comedy don't be confused um, you know low base kind of physical comedy can actually be quite a bit harder than wit or high comedy um, low not meaning that it has no value but just low in the in the fact that that's the jargon that, that we've used for hundreds of years so a dark comedy is one in which um, you can laugh at either the absurd or the dysfunction or death uh, dark comedies like I said pretty much anything with uh, Danny DeVito in it, Drowning Mona, um, Death to Smoochie, um, some of these stories that are kind of twisted or you're laughing at, um, something like Dexter, where we're laughing at murder. <laughs> oh, it's hilarious. Um, dead baby jokes, people love those, right? Comedy is something surprisingly individualistic. Some people have things that make them laugh. You'll be surprised when you go to a play what some people will laugh at. And sometimes laughing just comes as a byproduct of the awkwardness of certain moments. Um, but uh, even when you have a comedy, some things will make some people laugh and others, others is just interesting. So... As I said, tragedy or true tragedy is not as popular as it used to be. Death of a Salesman I have there because Arthur Miller, the great American playwright, set out to create a tragedy, an American tragedy. Um, and uh, I think he was very successful in the character of Willie Loman, uh, who is just truly tragic. Truly, truly tragic. As I said, it's not really popular today, the idea of bad people having bad things happen to them. Antiheroes are much more popular right now. We see people getting away with murder. Those kind of stories um, in our current philosophical schema seem to be much more popular in our current culture. The, in the tragedy mindset, it it is that wisdom comes from those who suffer. We see these people undergoing these tremendous amount of pains and the things that they're dealing with um, are extraordinary insight because they have suffered. And so um, usually there is a clear moral compass. There is a clear good guy and a bad guy, a clear right and wrong and a hero. And as we said before, it usually ends in death. Um, okay, realism. We talked about this a little bit when we talked about directors. Uh, it was primarily became popular with Konstantin Slanislavsky and Chekhov and the Duke of saxe meiningen uh, when the light bulb was introduced to the theater world. We had a need for historical accuracy. We had a need for slice-of-life drama, but we also started to have a huge revolution politically. If we look at some of the things that were happening in Russia, obviously, uh, which, you know, turned into communism, but the kind of uh, move away from uh, lords and um, the strict hierarchies, the uh, need to celebrate the everyday man, um, 
it is by far the most American uh, genre if you look at we talked a little bit about poetic realism glass menagerie uh, the um, Raisin in the Sun Crucible these are all realistic plays where we're getting just a slice of life um, like I said, it honors the common working man. There are discussions about taxes. There are discussions about how my mother suffered from um, a psychological breakdown which ended in suicide. I mean, just kind of every day, the nut and bolt, the grit and the gristle of life. Uh, realism, and in its extreme, naturalism, really hoped to give people the slice of life. If you were to criticize realism, particularly Ibsen, you might say that it feels like nothing's happening. When you go to see a Chekhov play, and they're sitting around talking for the whole show, right? People who like action movies, Aristotle might say, where's the killing? Where's the kissing? Where's the events going on in the story? Why are they just sitting around talking about the weather or you know um, and so that is a criticism but if you go in to see a doll's house or you go in to see one of these turn of the century dramas just know going in there's not going to be a lot of action in most of them so um, one thing to remember though is naturalism and realism came as a reaction against the romantics right so the royalists, which we don't really talk about in this chapter, but they were in France, Moliere, this sort of perfect ballet, this sense of rhyming couplets. Everything was very classic and exact. And the Romantics reacted against that. They didn't want everything to be perfectly structured. They wanted asymmetry. They wanted passion and excitement and things to be chaotic. So we see that in romantic art, um, you know, women with their clothes too big and they're swinging on swings and it has this sense of beautiful chaos. Um, and the romanticism was a reaction against the staunch and perfect classicalism of symmetry and exact exactness. And uh, so we look at the romantics, there was this surge of excitement with plays like Dracula and stories like Frankenstein, these romantic novels uh, really took it to extremes. But then of course, realism was then a reaction against that romanticism or melodrama, where they're saying, well, we don't want to honor these big heroes, we want to go back to the everyday man. So. The pendulum swings back and forth, and we see these reactions against reactions against reactions. In melodrama, there's usually a really, really good guy and a really, really bad guy, which, of course, we in our modern age, we hear that and we're like, wait, I thought Dracula was a good guy. Well, when it was originally written by Bram Stoker, Dracula was a horrible and disgusting beast who people wanted to stay away from, right? But he was someone revolting and these horrible, horrible villains, um, such as uh, Mr. Hyde, right? These horrible villains that you love to hate were popular in melodrama and romanticism. Usually involves a helpless woman, right? Oh no, I'm tied to the railroad tracks. We see that over and over again in these melodramas. If you look at the early silent movies and um, the novels, uh, the romantic novels, there's usually a helpless woman involved. Um, and a fair criticism of these is often shallow characters, right? Um, if you see a guy come in in a white hat in a John Wayne movie, which is John Wayne is melodrama, you know, you know that guy in the white hat is the good guy, and he's going to put his hands on the hips, dun da 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 save the day. Guy in the black hat, hat is going to be twirling his mustache and mo ha 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 uh, You know, Peter Pan, we look at Captain Hook, some of those characters, they're pretty shallow in their evilness or in their goodness. And it's interesting, once again, as we get into the anti-hero, which we're kind of in now, how some writers are sort of turning that on their heads uh, with shows like Once Upon a Time. Okay, 
So now we get into, I feel like uh, we're at like a family reunion and I'm going to introduce you to some of the weirdos. I still want you to know that they're part of the theater family and I deeply appreciate them within the theater family, but I can admit that they're weirdos, right? Um, Expressionism being one of the weirdest isms out there. It was a kind of theater that was based on, and we talked about a little bit with design, I know, one person's individual perception. So surrealism, if you've ever seen Dolly and the painting uh, of the melting clocks, right? Uh, it, it was the idea that we see things through one person's perspective and their imagined reality, um, their surrealist uh, reality is how it was represented on stage. Um, the American Dream by Edward Albury is by far my favorite expressionistic kind of play. Uh, I think that they're interesting, uh, but they're very weird. Very, very weird. It is definitely centered on feelings. It, they often feel nightmarish, and it's a big reaction to how the character is feeling at the time, the moods and the modes that are set up on stage. Um, so the philosophy of it is that any person's subjective reality is the truth, right? Um, same kind of thing if you hear a tree drop in the woods, does anybody else hear it? So it's relative to your own personal subjective perspective. Uh, if you've ever seen um, The Adding Machine by Elmer Rice or um, a silent movie, um, Metropolis was expressionistic, German expressionism, uh, very famous film, Metropolis. I recommend it if you've never seen it. It's visually stunning, uh, especially if you can see it on the big screen. They they screen them sometimes around Halloween, I've noticed, but um, it's very relative. It's often very design-centric. Uh, it's uh, visual rather than too philosophical. And expressionism was also an outpouring against film. When we started to see that film could represent reality, we're like, hey, the theater could do something that that film can't. Writers like Eugene O'Neill, uh, genius, one of the best playwrights of the American theater, Eugene O'Neill had his style that he was comfortable in. He used to write naturalism and he would write in his own colloquial tongue in the Northeast and um, write these beautiful f plays like Anna Christie that were very um, heart, you know, heartfelt and real and then he just decided to start playing with different kinds of genres different kinds of isms so he wrote things like Harry Ape uh, that were very um, tribal and it had these pounding drums and it was one person's kind of perspective so like I said many playwrights such as Edward Albee and Eugene O'Neill just tried on expressionism gave their hand at it and the Germans were most uh, famous for expressionism particularly with film. Speaking of Germans, we get into epic theater. Now, epic theater, if you say it to any um, theater expert, they'll automatically go to Bertolt Brecht, because Bertolt Brecht wrote philosophical um, books about what theater should be based on his plan for epic theater. Um, but the strict title of epic theater applies to any theater which happens over a long period of time, right? So for example, Mother Courage and Her Children, which you can see Meryl Streep here, happens over the 300 years war. So it's over a long amount of time and it's about some topic that is epic, that is larger than life, that is um, enduring and timeless. Uh, so, but Bertolt Brecht uh, lived in Germany at the time of World War II and he was able to escape and he came to um, America eventually and he was tried for communism. Uh, you know, have you now or have you ever been part of the Communist Party? And he lied and said that he wasn't a communist and then the next day he packed his bags and went back. Um, but it's really kind of amazing what he was able to accomplish in Berlin 
at, among the ashes of Berlin, uh, you know, as the bombs had hit other buildings, he was able to open a theater in downtown Berlin and run these plays with these political themes and really provide a catharsis for the people of Berlin. And then he took that show on the road and his wife was the uh, main character in a lot of these, uh, including Mother Courage and her children. He was really able to put his political themes of pacifism and of, um, well, it's kind of unfair to say pacifism, pacifism, sorry, I get into technicalities here, um, because he did, you know, he did say that war is necessary in some cases, but in really sad plays like Mother Courage and Her Children, I mean, everyone who Mother Courage loves just gets eaten up in this war machine. Um, so many casualties to war. Uh, so it really made you re-question. And of course, the people in World War II would have been sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, this is so true, or this has been, this is something that I can relate to. Um, but at the same time, Brecht had this fascinating way of inciting alienation for his audience. He didn't want them to get swept up in their emotions. He didn't want it to be just an emotional experience. He wanted people to think and then change their mind. He didn't want to appeal to their base instincts or mob mentality. He really wanted them to process and intellectualize and change their philosophies based on the plays that they were seeing. So um, part of that is alienation. For example, Aristotle says that we watch a play to see what happens at the end. Well, Brecht would have scene announcements. At the beginning of the scene, he would say, the scene in which the daughter dies. Right? He would have someone walk very matter-of-factly out onto the stage and say, this is the scene where someone, you know, the daughter dies, and then that person would walk back and they would start the scene. Right? So he wasn't interested in surprising people. He wasn't interested in maintaining a reality on stage. He didn't believe in curtains. He wouldn't have had big elaborate costumes. Uh, it was very much the ideas of the play were more important than getting swept up in the emotion. As you can imagine, this was not always pleasant. Don't go to a Brecht play expecting to put your feet up and enjoy the experience. He wants you to think. He wants to be in your face. He wants to challenge you. It's not unusual for you to be yelled at or sung at in a key that is unpleasant because he wasn't trying to make you comfortable. He was trying to make you uncomfortable. Um, there's a great Hamlet quote uh, where they say, um, hold, as it were, a mirror up to nature. Well, Brecht took that quote, that artistic philosophy of, na of realism, and he said, no. You know, Brecht said, art is a hammer with which to smash, right? So his idea was to shake things up, to revolutionize, to alienate, and help people think, not become part of a mass mob mentality, but to really um, get into... Uh, their own head and make these choices for themselves. So a really interesting documentary, if this sounds like something that you would like, is Theater of War. And it's uh, Tony Kushner did a reinterpretation of Mother Courage and her children, so I highly recommend that. All right, some more weirdo-isms, which I love. Uh, this is uh, Waiting for Godot image we have here with Steve Martin, um, and Robin Williams playing the lead actors in that. Um, the philosophy is that it is meaningless, that life is meaningless, so the plays are equally as meaningless. They keep waiting for this guy named Godot and he never shows up. Um, once again, this is one of those isms that came out as a reaction to World War II and the hopelessness and the meaninglessness of war. Uh, another one of my favorite absurdist writers is Eugene Ionesco, uh, Rhinoceros. People in town start turning into rhinoceros, right? And it's, uh, it's just absurd. It's ridiculous. And so actors were getting out on stage and huffing and puffing and stamping around, but it was kind of a a nod to the fascist. I mean, is it any more ridiculous in France where Ionesco was writing that all these people just welcomed Hitler with open arms and said, yeah, come on in, we'll uh, support you, you know, and uh, and these endings are often very unsatisfying. Like I said, Godot never shows up, 
right? They feel like they are hopeless. They feel like life is meaningless. Um, perhaps one of the greatest um, absurdists of our day uh, is Samuel Beckett. And um, one of his most famous plays is um, pictured on page 255, Happy Days. A woman is buried up to in dirt in her up to her waist and she's brushing her teeth and making phone calls and putting on lipstick and trying to make the best of it but she's still buried up to her waist in dirt and at the end of the day she's still hopeless and it still feels meaningless Um, and uh, if you want to just YouTube some of Samuel Beckett's shorts they're very entertaining you'll see a lot of British actors in them Um, uh, but they all kind of point back to the fact that life is unsatisfying at times and so kind of admitting that would have been healthy for the group and you have to remember too that these are the off-Broadway plays on Broadway we have uh, you know plays that are celebrating life and I've got rhythm I've got music who could ask for anything more uh, you know, so the people who wanted to escape went to those plays. The people who wanted to um, suffer through their pain and feel the catharsis together, they were going to see these absurd and existential plays to really bemoan the honesty of what they were going through. So now we're going to move over to Western theater, theater that was going on in Japan and China primarily. So in Asian countries the imagery and beauty is more important than what the people are saying so in many times we're creating stage pictures it's more dance and beauty oriented rather than a theater of ideas a play like Doll's House where people are just sitting around talking the whole play uh, that idea of a play like that just seems ridiculous from an Eastern standpoint Um, it's visual right there's big makeup big costumes big tricks and acrobatics it's more of what we would consider a circus in many cases it's not um, unfounded for mythic characters to show up for um, an old woman to be actually a fox and then you know this fox is somebody's ancestor and they just show up to tell them a message because they've been reincarnated. So these sort of supernatural happenings, ghosts, um, reincarnated animals, gods um, in the Katakali or Indian tradition, it's not unusual for those people to show up. There's not as much of a plot. Uh, As we said, Aristotle has sort of guided Western theater to have these satisfying endings, whereas Eastern theater, although there is plots in some Eastern plays, uh, many of them are much more leisurely. Uh, You know, somebody's playing a flute and and then a dancer shows up and then uh, and then another person comes along the road. It's not as action oriented. So in the Eastern tradition, um, many of these are traditions that are passed down from generation to generation or orphans are taught to be actors. So um, you could go and live in an actor training facility or else you were born into it. So um, it was a lifestyle from birth. I watched an interesting documentary that said Chinese Peking opera is the equivalent of having to hit the note like Pavarotti, then do a backflip and land in the splits. So the kind of training that these Asian actors were getting is much more intensive than the Western culture. Um, In India, uh, Sanskrit drama, uh, they believe that these are sacred. they're very eyebrow centric if you watch a short uh, clip of it you can see the way that their eyebrows move they happen overnight and it's not considered rude to just fall asleep during one of these long Sanskrit dramas you can see they're very percussive and dance oriented Uh, they're also not necessarily in clear theaters they can be rented out banquet rooms or somebody's home can host a Sanskrit drama but they're considered sacred the gods are meant to inhabit the people 
and uh, the children that are raised to present these characters go through hours and hours of correction and every little hand gesture and every little eyebrow gesture is considered tradition and they're taught it from a young age. Peking opera um, is uh, a beautiful form of uh, Japanese, I mean sorry, Chinese drama that um, there's two basic kinds. There are um, ones that go on in the home and the ones that present war. Uh, like I said, you know, monkeys, uh, kings or emperors, this began as a form of emperor worship. These plays would tell stories to the emperor on their birthdays or feast days. It wasn't uncommon for them to have it in banquet halls where people were eating or drinking. Um, so Peking drama was sort of abused and as such like any opera it it kind of was more of an elite thing and then it was kind of forced on the people. Um, so if you've never heard of Mao before uh, he was a communist leader and unfortunately he made some very strict changes in China that caused a lot of harm. He tried to rearrange their agricultural system and as a result millions upon millions starved to death. Um, in this really harsh cultural revolution he also used the Peking opera as something that he played on the radio to sort of enforce these um, Chinese values, which was pretty ironic because it had been a form of emperor worship. It had represented this kind of hierarchy um, between uh, people with stories worth telling kind of thing. Um, but after he used the um, songs as kind of a way to um, change people's minds, after he used them as propaganda, the people of China really began to resent the Peking Opera because they associated it with a leader who was um, kind of, for better or for worse, uh, very controlling. Um, so in these eight model plays it wasn't unusual for the capitalists to be painted as the bad guys, the obvious bad guys, and they were very mellow, dramatic. Um, so, but after and as China continues to be sort of um, moving towards a more capitalistic environment, a Peking Opera has been used in other facilities and now it's becoming more and more successful. And it's a source of pride for many Chinese people as their sophisticated art form. Um, and you can see it in the opera houses of Beijing, uh, as Peking is now called. Um, Japanese no is performed primarily by Buddhist monks. Uh, it's very meditative, it's very slow, it is very um, rhythmic. Uh, you can hear the drums in the background. As with all of these Asian art forms we've talked about so far, the number of steps, the hand gestures, all of these things are tradition that are passed down from one actor to the next. Uh, in, you know, if you did that in the Western world where you gave people exactly how to move, that would be considered almost copyright infringement. I mean, if you watched one version of Midsummer Night's Dream and then you watched another version and people acted exactly the same way, then you would think, Oh, well, that's not creative. Uh, but in Japanese, no, that, that's not the point. The point is to honor the gods and honor the ancestors by telling their stories. So uh, very slow, very um, contemplative, very thoughtful. Uh, uh, there's this whole elaborate walking down a, um, a runway almost as they come in. Uh, very quiet. And once again, this would be high art, kind of like our opera, something that only the elite or the very um, contemplative or religious would participate in these kinds of, of dramas. Kabuki is much more accessible to the masses. Kabuki is fun and, uh, you know, we see over-the-top gymnastics, foxes, uh, you know, rolling out from underneath the stage, fireworks. 
Um, but once again, we still have some pretty thoughtful themes. Um, it's not unusual to see suicide in a Japanese kabuki play. Um, their uh, traditions, as with all of these, the, the colors of costume, the wig styles, these are all are meant to represent certain personalities and thoughts, which we've kind of touched on in different lectures. So in conclusion, uh, those are just some of the Eastern and Western uh, isms, different genres, different traditions in which a theater play can be performed. Um, you know, you can take a play, uh, you know, such as Kabuki Theater, they've done a version of Macbeth in the style of Kabuki, in the style of the Japanese art form. So you can take a play and put a genre on it, or a play can be written in a certain genre. and we as theater appreciators need to know whether or not the play is against type or going with the type of genre that it was written in. It can be helpful for us as theater appreciators to know what kind of plays we like and to seek out those plays in the genre that we already appreciate. So I hope that you've met some strange cousins in the world of uh, theater genres and I hope that you'll take the time to sort of get to know them a little closer as you read your book and take just a moment to YouTube some of these for fun. It can be exciting and new worlds opened up to you. As always, thank you for listening.